I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. It's interesting, just as I was shifting into the talk portion, it began to rain. And I can hear the rain, which for me always feels like a kind of blessing, a kind of giving. Um, it seems so nice to have the rain start. Some of my favorite times meditating, maybe for you as well, have been while hearing rain. It's nice. Um, I'd like to talk with you tonight about a, a deliberately provocative topic. How do you know that you're a good person. And this topic might seem initially to be very psychological, very Dr. Phil or pop psyche. And really I want to explore it in a deep way with you, including the ways in which it's a window into four really fundamental aspects of the teachings of the Buddha and the Buddhist tradition with many personal benefits along the way. And I'm gonna give you a couple of um, entrees into this. So I would say for much of my life, um, I did not know that I was a good person. And in fact, if someone had asked me, so do you think you're a good person or a basically good person? I would have said, ah. I don't know. Um, and with that comes a lot of what Tara Brock has called the trance of unworthiness. We just don't feel adequate. We don't feel good enough. Uh, last week, I I, or two weeks ago rather, I talked about um, the tendency to feel, particularly some of us, that we're trying to escape from who we fear we are uh, and try to seek or become who we think would be better. And we miss sight of these qualities, uh, among other things, that were present in us, including as little children. If, if you were here two weeks ago, and you can look at the recording if you weren't, um, I invited you to consider maybe four words or phrases that were true about you as a little kid and are still qualities, beautiful qualities, in you here today and in the resting in these qualities, in the conviction of them. I referred to the word faith or conviction um, earlier, confidence in these qualities, the searching, the seeking, the escaping can, can fall away. So that leads into this topic here. And I wanted to give you a second example. I was talking with someone uh, earlier today who was considering um, a big project and and yet they couldn't get started. And what became increasingly clear is they couldn't get started because at some level deep down, they did not have confidence that if they actually got started and uh, pursued this project in a more, in a more visible, conspicuous, uh, financially robust way, that if it failed, it would be a really colossal flop. And because of that fear then, they, they couldn't get started. And in all that is um, doubt uh, of their own capabilities and also a fixation on what's external rather than um, what in psychology is called locus of control or being person referenced rather than externalities referenced in, in which this person didn't realize that they of course would be determined. They would of course bring their whole heart to it. They would of course bring all the ways that they really are already a basically good person. They didn't trust in that. They didn't trust in themselves. So this topic of how do you know you're a good person 
shows up in lots of ways. It shows up in how we feel like we matter enough to ask for and even insist on some things that we need to put our foot down, to really be clear seriously about things that matter to us. Knowing that you're a good person supports that. It also helps us be a lot more open to input from others. Because if we're not so sure we're a good person, we're going to tend to be more defensive and more prone to self-criticism or self-doubt if other people bring input to us. So we're going to paradoxically push it more away. So that on the other hand, the more that you know you're a good person, the more open you'll be to it. And there are numerous other benefits to letting this land inside that we're going to be exploring here, including letting it sink down to those younger layers. Last year, last decade, young adulthood, high school, early childhood, all the way down. So I want to do an exploration with you here. Yeah. So first of all, how do you know you're a good person? How do you know it? And this touches on the first of four major Buddhist themes, discernment, seeing clearly, being in reality. I think of bowing at the altar of reality, the truth of the way it is. Sure, our um, perceptions of the way it is, our understandings, they are constructed, doesn't mean that the way it is isn't the way it is. It just means that our perceptions are somewhat constructed. And yeah, we're, we're fallible and, you know, we need to be open to increasing clarification. But all that, at the end of the day, still points to and gets us pretty close to seeing clearly. Um, if you've ever done Vipassana meditation, Vipassana is about seeing into, seeing clearly. So <clears throat> one first way to know that you're a good person is through observation. And what do you see when you, when you observe yourself? What do you see when you observe other people? Let's start with discernment about others. It's often easier to start there. So there you are, and you could bring to mind any one of a number of people you know. Um, typically, you know, neutral or people you like, could even be people that you occasionally have issues with. What do you see over there? And what you probably discern is um, a complexity. A good metaphor is you see a mosaic. Or if we think of the streaming of consciousness, you see a river with multiple currents in it. Yeah. If you look at another person, you can see the ways in which they, um, you know, might get reactive or might sometimes swerve away from doing something that's important but hard. Uh, you know, you might see a little, uh, you know, righteousnesses, positions in them. But on the whole, what you would discern over there is that how do you know that's a good person? Think of the people you know that you would say, that's a good person. They don't have to be a saint. They could lose their temper sometimes. But on the whole, what you see over there is a comprehensively good person. You see it. You're discerning. You see their good intentions. You see their effort. You see their warm heart. You see the ways in which they learn, maybe grudgingly, <laughs> kicking and screaming occasionally, but a, but a learning. You see these things. Sure, work in progress. Sure, it could be more. Sure. But you, you'd you look over there and you'd go, um, I know you're a good person. Can you bring that same kind of discernment, the 
the facts, to the whole mosaic of who you are. Can you see the parts that could use some encouragement, some cheerleading, some backing their play, parts of you? And can you see other parts that need some regulation you know, or need some um, withdrawal of fuel from, or what is translated often in the uh, early Buddhism teachings, um, nutriment, nutrition, nutriments for those qualities. Can you see those things? Okay, you see those things. You discern them. And meanwhile, can you discern your own good intentions, your own efforts, your own good heart, your own learning and growing? You're here because you're interested in learning and growing, healing growing, and awakening. Can you discern that factually you are a comprehensively good person? Which <laughs> includes, if you're me, um, some things you're still working on. You might imagine saying to a friend of yours, someone you know, partner, you look at them and you go, you know, you are a comprehensively good person. On the whole, a good person. Well, sure. You've made mistakes, person over there. You've made mistakes, maybe big mistakes. No one gets through any kind of substantial life without making some big mistakes me included, I've definitely made some big mistakes. You can feel bad about your big mistakes. You can have remorse as it's appropriate for some of them while recognizing that the whole mosaic, the whole comprehensive mosaic is good. So if you imagine that kind of recognition for another person, that sort of discernment, can you discern that about yourself in a real way? Now, sometimes what comes up here is yes, but, yes, but. And I like the saying, get your butt out of the way, in two senses of that word, yes, but. I think there really are people that I at least would not say, are a comprehensively good person. And I don't want to get into edge cases because in yes butting, we often go out into edge cases or we fixate in our own life on the big but. Well, you know, I did this thing or well, I still do that thing. And it's easy to just have your attention narrow in on that thing. Yes, but that thing. You've lost discernment. You're not seeing clearly, not vipassana. See the whole, see it all, as the Buddha taught again and again and again. See it all, see all the intertwining, see all the causes and conditions, see all the relatedness in the vast net and fabric that is reality. See it all, see all of yourself and see if you can see that you are a good person. Which brings me to the second Buddhist theme after discernment, which is valuing. Oh, <laughs> it's like that's a dirty word in a lot of spiritual circles. Well, values, better and worse, what? Well, um, reality, material reality is what it is. and. I'm not sure I think there are values inherent in objective, big bang material unfolding. Life is absolutely value centered from the most basic viruses that value replication. Larger microbial life that, that values 
you know, moving toward food and moving away from danger, uh, you know, valuing maintaining its structural integrity as a kind of a bubble uh, with membranes on the outside and stuff on the inside. That's valuing all the way through life values. And throughout the Buddha Dharma, both the original early teachings in Buddhism and its proliferation or its growth through um, Tibet and China and Japan and now into the West, there's tons of valuing, right? Right off the top, the Eightfold Path is about right or wise, probably best translated actually is right. In other words, correct and beneficial, right view. That's a valuing of the right way to see things, <laughs> you know, uh, right intention right there, second in the list, you know, that's valuing and all the rest of that. So clearly there is a valuing of less suffering. There is a valuing of kindness over hatred. There is a valuing of compassion, the tender response to suffering in others and in oneself and a movement to address the systemic sources of preventable suffering grounded in systems of injustice. There's a there's a valuing of justice, of that which is fair, of that which is harmonious. So it's okay to, uh, to use words like good, and distinct from bad. We have to be careful about that. You know, we have to be careful about righteousness. We have to be careful about the bad purposes to which seeking the apparent good, including, frankly, and um, much of the history of many religions, including even in the present time. And um, shamefully in some parts of the world uh, by Buddhists, uh, just because of those pitfalls doesn't mean that we don't think it's good to feed children rather than let them be hungry. Uh, so if you can see qualities in yourself that are worth valuing, much as you can see qualities in other people, do you value that that person is a basically caring, decent, um, fairness-seeking person? You can value that. Can can you value effort? You know, I've kind of you know like a working class ethic or a you know a do your job sort of ethic. Try hard. Uh, you know, don't um, burn yourself out, but don't give up so quickly. Stick with it. You can value those qualities in others. What do you value in yourself? What is good about you, in you? Are there intentions in you that are good? Are there efforts that are good? What do you value? Can can you value in yourself what you value in others? If you value it in them, why don't you value it in yourself? We routinely value qualities in others that pff, we kind of shrug, meh, or dismiss in ourselves. Why? Why the double standard, right? Can you even take a few moments, a few breaths, a few minutes, maybe longer, maybe in a meditation, to just sort of scan the, con the whole of you, the whole mosaic, the totality of you and go, wow, what can you value uh, in your mind, in your conduct, um, in qualities? And even deep down, can you value those four words about yourself as a little kid that are still true for you today? You would value them, you do value them in other people. You might see them in me. We're here, you and I. You see them in me. 
Can you see them in yourself? Basic qualities, curiosity, openness, um, resourcefulness, persistence. Can you see these qualities in yourself? Can you see a fundamental sweetness deep down inside? Can you see that sweet little kid in you who just wanted to find out about things and be happy and be loved and be loving? You, that's you, that's you. So valuing, recognizing the good, appreciating that you're already good, and valuing it. And it's because we value being good, we keep encouraging ourselves to keep healing and growing and awakening. We don't sit on our laurels because we value the good and because we're confident uh, due to rec recognizing through you know, discernment the good in ourselves, yeah, keep going, keep heading up the higher road. It's good for others for you to recognize, you know, the goodness in yourself. Third, major theme in Buddha Dharma, arguably right at the center, one of the two or three things that really marked the distinction uh, and the creativity uh, in uh, the Buddhist teachings and path uh, is this emphasis on intention. Intention distinct from unconscious habit or empty ritual. Intention. Where are you coming from? What's your intention? And we tend to think about intention in Buddhist practice externally directed, right? Is, is it your intention to support others rather than tear them down? Is it your intention uh, to abstain? from taking what is not freely offered to abstain from, from stealing. And you can extend that out to many larger and larger scales systemically. Uh, what's your intention toward the world, toward the environment, toward other people, toward your own practice? Uh, you know, Do you intend to leave your shoes outside the meditation hall if that's the practice? What's your intention? Well, what's your intention applied to yourself? Do you intend to bring a quality of fair seeing and benevolence to yourself? Do you intend to know that you're a good person? What intentions? do you have to your, toward yourself? My wife and I are, in, are watching um, uh, all, all Creatures Great and Small, this uh, TV show about uh, a veterinarian, a group of veterinarians. And there's this funny moment, and it's traditionally situated on the eve of World War II in the late 1930s in Northern Ireland, I believe. You may have seen it, all creatures great and small. There we go. Uh, it's really quite lovely, and uh, it's very warm and wholesome and okay. And there's this moment where uh, this young man, again, it's in a traditional setting there, is going to the home of a particularly traditional family and with the, the father who's quite distinguished and fairly scary and the mother who's quite formidable and the young woman that he's very drawn to and there's a, a feeling between them. And as they're sitting down to dinner and he's of course a little nervous, at one point, I think I can't remember, it's either the father uh, or the mother turn to him directly and with regard to their daughter, just look at him and say, what are your intentions? 
<laughs> he is totally thrown for a loop. Ah, he's on the spot. And then they just start laughing and laughing at him because, of course, they're kidding him. Uh, but still, in, if you think of the weight of that, you know, and you could take it out of the, that particular time and place and frame, um, and the weight of what are your intentions, right? For real. You kind of want to know when you're with other people who are important to you, you're starting a relationship, what are your intentions? Are your, are your intentions to find what is good within me and support it and to nourish it and protect it and celebrate it and help it grow and join with it in all the days to come? What are your intentions? Much the same. What are your intentions toward yourself? Much as the tipping point of practice routinely is on the edge of intention, which Joseph Goldstein puts very eloquently, it's typically thought of toward others. And it also very much is about the tip of practice being intentions toward yourself. Are you here to support yourself or wear yourself out? Are you here to celebrate and appreciate clearly based on discernment what's worthy, what's good, in other words, what's valuable in various ways about yourself? Or do you have other intentions? Have you had other intentions? And going forward, whatever your past intentions may have been, can you from this day forward have good intentions toward yourself? Including the good intention to know that you're a good person. And then fourth major teaching in the Buddhist traditions, especially elaborated in Tibetan Buddhism and really elaborated in Chan and Zen. It's more implicit in early Buddhism, it's there. It's the recognition, the felt recognition of the intersection in the present of conditioned and unconditioned, time and timelessness, form and emptiness, continually, always. And in that resting in the ground, which might start conceptually, becomes more and more palpable, more and more felt, there's a sense of universality because all phenomena have the same nature. Deep down, all people have the same nature. So that the deep nature we recognize in others is also, our, is also your nature. Kristen Neff and Chris Germer and other, others speak of common humanity. That's part of this. But here, as we start to increasingly uh, kind of have more and more of a sense of abiding at the emergent edge of now continuously with, you know, kind of we're, we're living into form endlessly, uh, arising within a space that's not yet form, arising within a ground of something or other that's not yet form. That's, that's the way it is. Might sound like fancy talk. <laughs> I don't know. It seems like really simple talk to me. It, that is the way it is. It is the way it is. Wow. Continuously. You know, the bottom continuously falls out and is continuously uh, uplifted and renewed right at the wellspring of the present, continuously. And as we rest more and more of that, um, we start to feel just 
the kind of the beyond words all rightness of reality as it is. And um, distinctions around being good or bad do start to fall away as you rest there increasingly. And like doubts of adequacy, uh, shaming, destructive, harsh self-criticism, it all falls away as, as you rest more in, in the natural state. It is the natural state of the way it is, uncomplicating, undisturbed, undefended in the present. And in that resting, um, there's nothing wrong with you. <laughs> because there's nothing wrong in, in that present emergence of reality continu continuously. Yeah. And you might have an intuition of that, or you might actually have a lot of sense of that. And um, I think this is the, the transmission, really. It's the witnessing, it's the abiding of great teachers who are really, 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 really rested right here in ongoing emergence and passing away. So I want to open it up for discussion, right? Yeah. Um, these th four major themes, really in deep practice in Buddhism, central themes running all the way through. Discernment, valuing, intending, and whoosh, opening. And all of those are ways into this very heart-touching, inner child healing, um, deeply just answer to the, to the question, how do you know you're a good person? These are four ways of knowing that you are a good person and really, really, really letting it sink in. And as a tiny, tiny little PS to the whole thing here, what happens when you know you're a good person in terms of the second noble truth of craving? Contracted, some deficit-based. It's a drive state. Something's missing, something's wrong. What happens to that when you know you're a good person? You really let it sink in. Craving falls away. It's a tremendous aid to Dharma practice, to an ordinary psychological functioning practice, to let it really land and to, to know you're a good person. Knowing you're a good person is a great aid to the lifetime uh, practice, lifetime project, really, of becoming increasingly released from the biology and the learned habits of craving. It's on mission, in other words. Okay, so I want to, I see a couple hands, yes, and I'm particularly drawn to people who haven't raised their hand before, so it's uh, just to know that. I'm also going to take a peek at some um, Books, I mean books. Sorry, to things that have uh, uh, you know people have put in the um, commentary. Okay, great, um, excellent. All right, so I'm going to just start here. Anya Net, Anya Net, and then Karen. And maybe I'll be able to swing back to you, Lynn. I've just we've spoken before, so sorry. I hope that I'm not being prejudiced there. Okay, so Anya Net, I'm asking you to unmute. You have to unmute yourself. And if you're willing to turn your camera on, that's nice, but you don't have to. Okay, great. So I'll just say this. I always say this. I should have said it. Please ask a succinct, clear question about a topic of general interest related to what I've talked about tonight. Okay? Pressure's on. Great. I'll try to keep it short. Um, I will say in the past year and a half, I moved to a new place. And in this new place in my circle... It 
there are multiple people in my immediate circle whose parents have bought them a house. Um, and that's something new for me. I haven't really experienced that. Who cannot what again? Who I'm surrounded with uh, younger people who whose parents have bought them a house. Who cannot have what in the house? Oh, I'll, I'll try again. Um, Sorry. My it's old okay. ears. It's my ears, not your mouth. Something I would like to have in life is to become a homeowner. And I feel that it feels so far away and out of reach. And I noticed that I'm becoming more and more frustrated. Um, Oh, I understand. Thank you for those who helped my aging years. Now I understand. Yeah, so you have a goal. You would like to own a house. Yes. And, okay. What's noticed, the question? What's the question the, about my that? My question is, how can I get in a place of focusing on my locus of control? Yes. And Very how good. can I get in a place of being on my own side instead yeah. of a place of being angry, frustrated, yeah, um, and yeah. overwhelmed, and also like maybe despairing. Well, you're asking a deep question, and we could extend that question, of course, to other other goals that people have and other frustrations and other ways in which you know we're in a we're in a class structure. Yeah, Some people, and I would say comparison. Yeah, is something I'm really struggling with. Yeah. Um. Yeah. And it's it makes me feel like not a good person to, when yeah. I'm comparing myself that way. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought this up, and maybe I'll do a whole evening on it. We could just start with you and just do a whole evening sometime. So, I'll, but I'll be brief here. So, um, one thing I suggest doing, and I to everybody, uh. Take a look at the chapter in my book, Resilient, on aspiration. And I also explore that material in my some of my online programs. And you can always do any of my online programs for free if you have financial need. No worries at all. Okay? So this whole territory of aspiring without attachment, tending to the causes without being a you know, while being at peace with whatever the results might be um, and making your offering, it's very, very fundamental. So I'm gonna maybe offer three things, you know, and then I better keep going here, okay? All right, great. So one is to try to go to the bird's eye view and and recognize there, the, the many, many, many impersonal factors in the mix that are not your fault. They're not your fault. They're pretty powerful, many of them. They're not about you. So that can really help us not suffer it so much. It becomes more of an objective problem. It's like, there you are, you wanna have a, a picnic with your friends at the park and a big rainstorm comes in. It's not personal, but it's still a problem to solve. That, right, but this bird's eye view, big picture, it affects you personally, but it's like you're affected personally by being carried along by a river. The river's not about you, it's just the river, um, right? So that, that can be really, really helpful. A second thing that can be really helpful is to not feed rumination, not feed envy, not feed resentment, not feed um, anger at your parents or your family. You know, if it arises, it arises. But the Buddha talked about don't let it invade your mind and remain. And so much of our suffering comes from what we feed. You know, the parable of the two wolves in the heart, you know, you could, there's a lot of uh, early Buddhist teaching that's about what fuel do you offer to the fire? Because there was a lot of fire ritual, you know, back in those days. So there's a lot of focus. Plus the Buddha was a farmer, you know, <laughs> what are you fertilizing, <laughs> right? Are you fertilizing the weeds? 
<laughs> or, the, or the flowers and the fruits. Second, right? So firmer one, big picture, it, objective view, try to see it more impersonally, even though it affects you uh, personally. See it more impersonally, even though it has personal consequences. Second, um, don't feed the beast, right? And then third, make a plan. Just your own plan, your own plan, all right? You know, you, you got dealt a, you got dealt the hand you got dealt. A lot of people got dealt a better hand, often, you know, many of it rooted in systems of unfairness. Some people got dealt probably a worse hand than you, maybe also rooted in systems. And I'm not saying that to diminish the impact on you, right? But bottom line, okay, those are the cards in your hand. This is today. You're as old as you are, you know, tomorrow, what are you going to do? What's your plan? And, um, you know, and uh, that's really, really a good thing to know. It's good to have a plan, step by step. And many things that seem very hard, if you have a plan that's day by day, drop by drop, step by step, really, you can work your way toward it. Um, even something as significant as buying a house. You may need to find your way into buying a tiny house. You may find your way into buying a mobile house. You may find your way into buying a different kind of house in a different place, perhaps. You know, maybe that's where you you start. Uh, and I'm not I gonna keep moving here, but I won't get in the detail. But know what your plan is. You know, I've been in many screwed up situations, including some where my life was on you know, the line, and you need a plan. <laughs> Even if it's a bad plan, a bad plan is better than no plan because the feedback from the world about a bad plan will help you make a good plan, right? And then you feel like, okay, it's your secret plan. Maybe it's 15 minutes a day. Maybe you save a dollar a day, right? And you just keep doing that. That's your plan in the, in the piggy bank. Bingo. Or maybe, you know, maybe you're developing more income sources for yourself. Maybe you're moving in a certain direction. You have a plan. You know, action binds anxiety. Okay? That's my big three. I'm sure there are more. Check out the chat sidebar. People are cheering you on, you know? Right on. All right. Super duper. Thanks to you. Thank you, Anyanette. Okay, Karen. Uh, and I can see Lynn. I'm so sorry. I won't be able to get to you. Okay, so Karen... I don't think I've heard from you before. I'm asking you to unmute. Thanks. Okay. Hi. Um, just trying to turn on my thing there. Okay. Hi, uh, Rick. My question is on two levels, my own personal level and sort of my concern more generally about the world and what goes on in the world. So, and yeah. my question is, we who are people joining you are probably mostly people who are actually good. And that's why we're joining you because <laughs> we want to do better. We want to develop ourselves, etc. Then there are all these people. What to do about them? Is that your question? <laughs> what do you do about the people? I have one in my personal life yeah. and then all kinds of people generally who would never um think of themselves as not good even though they really are not good <laughs> yeah yeah i totally got it so so what do we do about them yeah so i'm gonna, i'm gonna ask you what might seem like a stupid question but it's a fundamental one and there is there are answers to it which is why are they your problem well i was married to one for 30 years so he was a big problem yeah there is an answer exactly so he's the father of my children and you know yeah, so yeah. i'm stuck with them everywhere yeah. yeah oh yeah yeah so i just want to make the point how can i put it we can get preoccupied with other people and we can make them a problem in our minds when they don't have to be in a problem in our minds we can recognize that they're a problem for our country or we could recognize that they're a problem in our company you see what i'm saying but i think um, it's easy in our um, media-saturated political combat, <laughs> you know, uh, what's the thing, uh, uh, the, you know, 
not Blade Runner, but uh, Road Warrior. There we are, like the Thunderdome of politics these days. Uh, it's crazy. We can get really preoccupied with how bad they are in in ways that don't have anything to do directly with with us that we can do anything about right now. All right, so part one. Part two, I think clear seeing is really important. I'm all for it. You know, in my book, um, that just came out, Making Great Relationships, it has a whole bunch of stuff in it about resizing relationships. It, yeah, including maybe you're stuck with them, like they have, he has legal custody, you shared legal custody maybe and blah, blah, but you can reduce contact, you can get them out of your head, you not give them rent-free space in your mind, um, things like that. So I think I'm all for clear seeing. Nothing what I'm saying is about rose-colored glasses. It's often the case that even in people that we look at it and going like, wow, you know, you're a piece of work over there. Or wow, you know, you look all nice and charming, but really, I I see you. Like the Buddha, I see you, Mara. Maya Angelou, when people show you who they are, believe them the first time. You know, I see you. Yeah, even with someone like that, very often you can still see their suffering and have compassion for it. You can... St- you can still see that twisted place inside that's playing out a lot of crap they acquired when they were a little kid. You know, you can see, um, you know, leaders, world leaders who all look all big and powerful, and you can just look at them and they're like desperate, desperate to avoid experiencing what it's actually like to be them deep down inside. You know, and deep down inside, it's a hell realm a desperate flight from who they're afraid they are. You know, a worthless weakling because that's who their parents told them they were, right? So that's, I would say that. And then um, last I'll just say, maybe to my suggestions, and it's not like I'm trying to give a pronouncement from on high. I mean, you know, Sharon, now I, my own, how I look at it. I think it's really important to, to, to be appropriately assertive. You know, oftentimes we kind of sputter in our minds and maybe to other people, you know, like we complain about others, but we don't take appropriate action. I don't mean action like we're coming in guns blazing inappropriately, but appropriate action. We don't, we don't, what are you, what are your intentions toward yourself, including to stand up for yourself and to stand up for principle and, and to, to call it and to name the truth. Very often in life, we can't change others, but we can name the truth. We can speak truth. Or just bearing witness. We just look at them. And we don't play their game. We step out of the script they're trying to cast us into. Just that is a is a claiming of power, right? To, to refuse to sanction their BS or to or to buy into their framing. No, we're not in your movie. I'm not in your movie. That's your movie. Good luck with that one. I'm, I'm out, you know? So I'm, I'm big on assertiveness, just on a good foundation. Okay, can we leave it there? Yes, yes. Hopefully that was useful. I don't useful. know what they'll do with yeah. those people, but that's a bigger question. Oh, you know, they're doing we what can they're, ignore yeah. them. We can ignore them, but they're I kind know. of ruining our world, right? <laughs> they are. We have to join together at scale. Yeah. And I, I, I appreciate the, I believe it's a Jewish proverb, better to light a single candle than to curse the darkness. Right. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. So finishing here. I would just like to, you know, encourage us all to come back, me as well, These to the question, how do you know you're a good person? Well, four ways to know that you're a good person grounded in four deep themes in Buddhist practice. Seeing clearly, discernment, valuing, recognizing and appreciating, appreciating that which is good, intending. What are your intentions toward yourself? And do you intend to know that you're a good person and to let that knowing sink in? And resting in the well of being, resting in true nature, resting in how it actually is fundamentally, uh, you know, in which there's nothing wrong and nothing missing. And 
you're already profoundly good.